Phenoloids Podcast, here to tell you that we've teamed up with Vault Comics to help bring some of their creators a spotlight. Vault Comics, based out of Missoula, Montana, have been bringing some of the best fantasy, sci-fi, and horror comics to print since 2016. We're getting the chance to read some of their series early, and we're getting to discuss with the creative team the vision for their series. We're very happy to be collaborating with Vault Comics and sharing these number ones with you. Welcome to Exploring the Vault. Cue the intro. Allies Podcast, Kyle here with Jeremiah and two very special guests. We have Ryan Nobbs and Jerry Sags, the Nasty Boys, but not really. We have the creative team of The Nasty. <laughs> I'm John Lees, the writer of The Nasty, and a bunch of other stuff, including Sink, Hotel, The Crimson Cage, and then Emily Was Gone, Mountainhead, probably some other things I'm forgetting. And I'm Adam Cahoon, I'm an artist for The Nasty. I also self-publish my own comics, have The Tufts, Origin House, and Anomaly, as well as a Silver Surfer Grey fan comic that I made to some acclaim. Tell us about your yourselves and your career in comics when did you guys get started what made you get into it yeah i've been lingering around comics like a week going on 12 or 13 years now i first started in comic would have been maybe around 2009 i'd graduated from university like i was going to do a short film that didn't pan out so i was a bit of a loose end and i was talking to a friend who was an artist friend of mine and they wanted me to write a comic for them to draw and I'd always loved writing, I'd always loved comic, but I'd never put the two together and thought, oh, I could write a comic book. So I ended up writing my first comic script, which was the standard about a superhero of the 1960s who gets old, retires, comes a chemistry teacher, and has to come out of retirement in the present day to investigate the death of his former sidekick. It ended up being that my friend, the artist, didn't draw it, but the idea stuck around in my head and ended up getting paired up with an editor and we found another artist and we got it published and the rest was history and since then I've had the bug and I've kept on making stuff and telling more stories. I didn't really get into comics until about 2015. I was a painter before that. I went to school to be a painter and sort of in that process. And I was very fortunate enough, you know, to get some solo shows and have a gallery that represented me. But I found in that world, once you get out of school, it's very sort of isolated and you just sit in a cave and you make art all the time and then you go out and present it and there's no real sense of community. And then a friend of mine wrote a script for a graphic novel and handed that to me and asked me to draw it. And then I realized almost right away how much more of a team effort comics can be and how much more of a community there is around building comics because you can do it all yourself. You can write and draw and letter and color and everything, but more likely you're going to have an editor or a writer or a colorist, a team to work with. And that was the idea of like building art in a community like that was so much more exciting and invigorating to me. And so that first comic that my friend wrote, it's called Greetings from the Maglev. And we put that on ourselves. The first comic I did, it was 120 pages, just straight through. I'd never drawn a comic and I just went and I just went go. And it was fantastic. Like it was so much more satisfying than, like I said, just sitting in my studio and painting all the time. And then I started going to cons and I realized how kind of possible it was to you know, fold and staple and make your own comics. Like John said, I got the bug and I started writing and drawing my own comics probably around 2017. I've been doing that ever since. And then I started doing design work for other people's comics, like logos and design and putting them together with Tim Daniel from Vault. And then that's how I got picked up for The Nasty when that book needed some help. And Tim called me in to kind of do some background stuff for it and design some posters. You know, every time I turned something in for them, the project kept growing and they said, okay, do you want to do this now? Do you want to do this now? And then George unfortunately had to drop out and they said, do you want to just do the whole book? And I went, oh, that sounds awesome. When Tim first presented me with the option of doing the entire book, Tim told me issue one and two are done. It's a five issue series. You will have to do three issues tops. And I said, okay, that sounds great. You know, because I've got a day job and a wife and a kid and life happening. And then turns out it's an eight issue series. For well, six Adam, months. you'd know that like, there's always an extra skate at the end just when you think it's over. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> I think I just read recently issue eight is slightly longer. I think there are slightly more pages in issue yeah. eight. So I'm going to get to issue eight yeah. and you're going to be like, oh, no, no, no. There's a whole other graphic novel attached to this you have to do now. <laughs> <laughs> interesting stuff I have to dig into now maybe go to art gallery oh for sure the gallery that represented me unfortunately they closed down I think like right around the time I started doing comics but their website's still up and I think so the, the loss still. of you was so devastating they just like shut up shut up <laughs> yeah <laughs> maybe I'll shut down too I gotta find something else luckily comics came along and that was just what I needed well obviously you two have a great rapport so that leads to my next question of how you two work together it's been miserable it's just been <laughs> <laughs> he's crying like every day and I know because I demand to see the video of him crying because I'm not <laughs> <laughs> so. 
<laughs> Why? I was given a bunch of movie titles to draw some posters for the background of the video store in the story. You know, I had no contact with John and no contact with the team outside of Tim, but he sent me this list of movie titles that John had written and they were just the titles. I mean, I think one of them had a little synopsis. I think it was Taste Buds had a little yeah, synopsis. The only ones I wrote was like yeah. Taste Buds I wrote down two undercover cops who are chefs and then like there was the other one that was like special delivery and I was like a postman who removes lovers. Yeah. And that yeah. Was, like, you know, the, the, but I can tell yeah. just from the titles I was like I already like John he's got jokes <laughs> like he's got a really good sense of humor this is going to be a fun project and then we got to know each other you know I got more involved and it's just been really easy working with them as you can see it's just a charming son of a bitch it's just been fun John you, you like tell me. him how much you like me yeah <laughs> <It's all right>. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah like it's been a really positive experience you know like, like you say I think like you know like what Adam was saying earlier on about how like one of the great things you know about comics is the collaboration and working with other people I mean I remember years ago like at a convention I was in a Q&A and like it was me and a couple of other writers and artists and someone asked the question like what's the process of collaboration like and like this other artist who's a very nice guy very sensitive soul was like oh it's a bit like in Twilight how when like a werewolf like you know imprints on someone and they're bonded together for life and that's what a writer and artist is like and then I replied saying well actually it's more like a human centipede but so like it's this kind of white chain but you have to have like you know like I know like any shit that I do gets pumped in for me to the next person so like so, so like you know you have to make sure you've got someone that they can, they can handle your shit and like and I think like you know me and Adam have a instantly like it was a great rapport and it's like just the kind of relationship that I like to have We're talking just about every day Adam sending me stuff like here's a character design here's a cover here's some panels what do you think of this what do you think of that like what should I do for this and I think that's great because like I don't like it like you know obviously there's been times where like I've had working relationships but everything's compartmentalised where I'm the writer I'll send the script to an editor and the editor will send the script to the artist you know and I don't like working like, I like having a direct channel of communication with the artist so we can talk we're kind of creatively riffing off of each other and I think you know it's great when an artist can like do exactly what you had envisioned on the page but it's even better when you have someone like Adam and he's like I had this great idea why don't we do this and it's kind of like we're building on each other's ideas and I think it makes for a really fun relationship that kind of back and forth and I've really enjoyed the process of working with Adam and he's just like a lovely guy as well so that makes it even better good job stroking each other's egos that's awesome good job <laughs> I would have just like, you know, like held each other's genius. <laughs> <laughs> now, John, we were warned that you are a big horror fan. So we are going to ask for horror recommendations, but you can only give us three. So choose oh. wisely. Okay, because we're talking about the nasty, we're talking about video nasties. I want to tell you a gem of a movie that was on the video nasties list that a lot of people haven't seen. Someone on Twitter, it was actually Trevor Henderson, who's a great horror recommender and guy, but he said it's the most slept on horror movie of all time. It's called Dead and Buried from 1980. It's kind of like a twist on a zombie story. It's like a pre Romero zombie, but like giving a modern twist. It's all set in a small town, really atmospheric, quite ghoulish, quite darkly comic. Highly recommended. Horror comic, I'm just going to go for the big one, I'm Junji Ito. This was a comic that I read that in maybe about 2010 when I first read it and it blew my mind and I think I spent like the rest of my career essentially chasing like that high of one, trying to read something as scary as Uzumaki and two, trying to create something as scary as Uzumaki. I think it's a masterpiece, one of the best comics ever made. And finally, horror book without pictures, a novel. I'm going to go for The Fisherman by John Langan. That was really hard not to suggest a Stephen King book because Stephen King is my favourite author <laughs> but I'll try something different. The Fisherman by John Langan is really tense, kind of nightmarish. It's kind of all about like the way stories take shape and change over generations, kind of like a folk horror, but set in the US and New England. Really atmospheric. Check it out, it's great. There we go. I kept it to see. <laughs> Good job. Now, Adam, do you want to throw any out that you have? Actually, what's interesting is John and I have never talked about Junji Ito. I'm not a big horror film fan, but I love horror illustration, horror comics, and I think Junji Ito is incredible. If you guys haven't read him at all, it's just they're real spooky. I think comics do spooky really well, and he's kind of the best at it. I think he's a little bit more, I think, blended with Twilight Zone in a way that I really like. Really funny but as also, well, which is underrated for. Yeah, he's got a real good sense of humor. I mean, it's buried in there, but it's not dead. I don't know if this is really horror, but Charles Burns' Black Hole. I don't know if you guys have. I would consider that, that horror. horror. Yeah. Yeah. I actually yeah. turned to that book a lot. I started working on the nasty. But yeah, I think Black Hole is absolutely incredible. The story itself, but the artwork is just top shelf and then for comics I think the plot from Vault I think is really quite incredible and it's really short it's a really quick read yeah 
but movies, I got nothing. I'm sorry. And books, I read it <laughs> once. I think in junior high, I thought it was oh, incredible. Well, yeah, I think it's a great story. That's maybe the only yeah. horror book I've ever read. So if you want to choose one, you chose a good one. Did you guys have a video rental spot? Maybe you have a story about or just the store you frequented when you were younger and everything wasn't digital and streaming and nonsense? I remember how much of an event it was that we got to go to the video store. I remember when Blockbuster came and it was like video stores with the lights on. Mm-hmm. But this was like pre-Blockbuster where everything's still kind of dank and windowless and, you know, there's a curtain that you're not supposed to go behind. I would just walk back and forth and try and see what was in there. But I missed that. And you could rent VCRs and you could rent video game systems. Like it was such a different animal back then. Yeah, no, actually, like, obviously the nasty, like uh, the whole DNA of that is tied around to like my love of old video shops and that being a form of experience of like my childhood. And like the story's set in Rutherland. Rutherland's where I grew up. When I grew up, when I was born, I was young, I lived on Rutherland Main Street. And I remember it was like a five minute walk in a straight line to get to Video World in Rutherland Main Street. And when I was like five, six years old, I was allowed to just go out myself and go get a couple of videos and come back home again <laughs> because it was so close. And this place was like, you know, very permissive. So I would walk away to the video shop and I'd come home with a copy of like Peter Pan and Maniac Cop 3, Badge of Silence, you know. Or <laughs> 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 Child's Play 2 or something like that, you know. <laughs> so I was like watching horror stuff from a really young age. So for me, like, you know, the idea of like horror and scary movies that is intrinsically tied into like the joy of the video shop of like you know walking around these aisles looking at all these covers and all these garish posters going what could that story possibly be like demonic toys I bet this is really scary you know <laughs> you know, you know. I think like that was just some part of the fun and I just think like obviously we have Netflix now and we have like you know YouTube Amazon and every infinite number of movies at the touch of a button but I love that kind of like mystery of like you know before you could check the view scores on Letterboxd or IMDB just hoping for the best and I just loved like my <laughs> video shop put a popcorn machine in the shelf so you'd, you'd, meet, you'd, meet, you'd get a wee popcorn you'd take home with you as well and it was great although in terms of a video store story to give you my probably favourite video store story was the first time I ever saw from Dust to Dawn I would have been about maybe 10 or 11 years old when it first came out and I had no idea what from Dust to Dawn was and the video shop gave me a blank cassette so I didn't have the cover on it no blurb or anything they just said this movie's really good you should check it out and so I I watched from dusk to dawn having no idea that there was vampires in it I was like oh this is like an action movie thriller like a road movie That's and amazing. then like suddenly the vampires show up about 45 minutes and yeah. I'm like what am I watching and like that is the best way you that movie. And I'm really kind of like sad that not everybody got to watch the movie that way. I knew it was vampires going into it. And so the whole first yeah. chunk of it, you're just like, okay, where where are the vampires? What's happening? That's really awesome. Yeah, so I'm actually not no idea. vampires. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. and I'm, old, I'm still getting over the Teddy Twister, you know, but, you know, I'm still going to come to terms with that, you know, and the thing yeah. Sam Hyde was amazing and made it in the vampires show up. So mine and Kyle's generation was like the death of video stores, unfortunately. I remember going to the video stores and there was a movie that Michael Keaton was in that I went to rent but because it's a DVD and it's a rental they just grabbed like the actual disc and put it in the case and the name of that movie was Jack Frost there's also a horror movie oh, named Jack Frost. <laughs> <laughs> so I saw that at 10 years old instead of the Michael Keaton Jack Frost movie so mine wasn't quite horror it was kind of the opposite I guess I remember me and my mom went to get 28 days a zombie movie it was a different 28 days so it was a Sandra Bullock yeah. rehab movie yeah <laughs> <laughs> which is 28 days of Sandra Bullock Freeman, but then the second part is like 28 days later and then it's 28 weeks later yeah it yeah. was very disappointing <laughs> we watched it but you know as like a 12 year old I was like this is not the weekend <laughs> well, we're going to have <laughs> <laughs> like the zombies are coming I know thing. it <laughs> so if you guys could briefly describe your like daily routines to us like John how many hours do you spend writing Adam how many hours do you spend drawing yeah yeah it's kind of like a how long is a piece of string type question I try and be quite ruthlessly scheduled if I can and normally like every like, let's say Saturday I'll write out like a weekly to-do list you know like with bullet points and as part of that like as daily goals I'll set like hitting like a certain level of progress in the script like normally let's say so like Monday, all right, plan the script. Tuesday, all right, start the script. And I think if I even start a page, that's doing well because it's always the hardest to start a script. And like Wednesday, it'll be get a quarter through, then a third of the way through, then halfway through. So that's kind of like, a, I try, that's the way I kind of like write, like, you know, I do progress markers. And I try like, you know, and be quite forgiving of myself as well, where like, you know, once I reach a certain point in the night, like, you know, I try not to kind of like burn the midnight oil and like, you know, write away because I think like, you know, I did that in the past and it's a good way to burn yourself out. So like, even if I haven't hit my goals, once I reach a certain point in the night, I always like to kind of 
of like end things and disconnect and go and do some yoga or watch a movie or do a kind of like cool down before bed? I have what's called a three-year-old. <laughs> so <laughs> my routine has to be fluid to kind of fit around her chaos. I'll get up earlier than everybody else. I'll try and get up around six every day with recent daylight savings. That's been really difficult. Now I'm getting up at five technically. So I try and get up before her or my wife even wakes up just so I can get two hours in, three hours in every single morning, right? Every day I got to, you know, chip away at it. And then what I found to be kind of valuable on this project is I sort of look ahead in the script and I sort of try and designate like easy pages and difficult pages or like easy sections and difficult sections. And, you know, whenever it looks like I'm having a good, you know, chunk of time, I hit the hard pages as much as I can. And then I try and push all the easy pages for like days where my daughter's not feeling well or I have to take her to school or there's kind of too many things going on. And that way in the course of the day, if I only have a couple hours, I jump on it and I find the pages I can do in that time, right? Find the panels I can do in that time. And I just go because the daughter, the wife, the day job, like I have to find time throughout the day, every day to draw. There isn't like, oh, I get Saturday. I get like eight hours on Saturday. It's like, I might get two hours today. I might get 30 minutes tomorrow. I might get six hours the next day. So I have to sort of know what John's written and fill in those pages when I have a level of time. There is no routine. <laughs> chaos. <laughs> it's just managed chaos. So it is that time, the synopsis. I know. So the last day is a uh, coming of age for a comedy set in 1990 Scotland against the backdrop of the video Nasty's Moral Panic. And what that means long term is that the video Nasty's Moral Panic was this period in British history where the right wing government, along with like media and various other provocateurs, were essentially like creating a hysteria around horror movies and video shops and saying they were corrupting the youth. So they were getting banned widely. And against that backdrop, this group of kids that's at the centre of the story form a club at a local video shop and they start watching banned horror movies it's like on the down low and the main character in this group is Thumper Connell who is this lonely kid who is back when he was young invented an imaginary friend who was the star of his favourite slasher movie Red Ennis and even though he's 18 years old he still has that imaginary friend so these kids get hold of this banned videotape which they plan on screening as part of a horror festival to reverse the fortunes of this struggle video shop but things go wrong and they end up you know destroying the tape and having to make their own version of it but in the process of doing that they might have awakened something which makes pretend horrors become quite real and that might have an effect on various things including Thumper's imaginary friend It sounds like the nasties was a lot like the comic book scare in the 50s where stuff was getting banned and there was all this panic and the and government this was stuff trying to never recycling itself it's like you had like the kind of like the seduction of the innocent in the 1950s yep. We had like the video nasties and like, you know, corrupting the youth of the 80s. They're in the 90s in America. They had the video game panic. The video games were causing violence and shootings and all that. And now it's right up to the present day. We have now it's like, you know, drag shows or like books that have like gay people in it that's supposedly, you know, corrupting the minds of the young. Like, you know, it's always going to be like something which like, you know, the regressive forces of the world are going to point to and say, that's what you should all be angry about instead of the actual problems that we're causing. So it's always going to be topical we read the nasty all i could think when i got to the end of the second issue was like this is a horror version of be kind rewind this is awesome <laughs> wait, <laughs> wait, enough, wait, like, it, i have it, never it seen be like kind that. people keep on saying that but i guess like, kind of, like of the that general like type of movie that like inspired me i was thinking more like one cut of the dead or bowfinger was a big movie for me back in the early dvd days mm-hmm. or like you know son of rambo so like definitely movies of that ilk, like you know were in my head when i was thinking about making this story you know it's probably my most personal comic I've made that obviously get through the mix. Jeremiah, speak for both of us, we thoroughly enjoyed it and I appreciate you let us read issue two as well. It would have been too much of a cliffhanger. Like I would have been like <laughs> searching for spoilers this whole interview but like at least with <laughs> issue two I'm like okay now I see where it's going and everyone else will have to wait but I didn't have to and I'm going to brag about <laughs> it. <laughs> but with that, something that also stood out was the characters. So if you both could kind of give like the character design process You know in my mind like you know I wanted to make sure that all these characters felt like people that you might have known, you know, or like you might be. So that was something in my head when I was like, you know, first developing the characters and their voices and their personalities. In terms of like the design, I know like, you know, George had a big hand in initial designs and stuff. And one of the hardest characters to design actually, what that we talked about a lot at the time was Red Ennis or Imaginary mm-hmm. Slasher, because it turns out the 
that it's really hard to come up with a new slasher because every single mask you can think of like has already been used anything that covers somebody's faces has been used in a horror movie already so what I ended up doing was like I was thinking right well Red Ennis is the star of Labor Day which is our kind of like Halloween analog franchise series there's eight Labor Day movies so like for Labor Day like what kind of villain would be the villain of Labor Day so we're thinking like it's the vengeful spirit of the worker you know he's dressed in plaid and Timberland boots and he carries around a railroad spike you know to kill people then when I thought of railroad I thought well why don't we make his mask like literally like the front of a train and so it has like the little white headlight at the front it's got the big grate in there where his mouth would be so it looks like a train face and I think I actually sent George some really bad drawings of like here's what <laughs> I think Red Ennis would look like so I sent these scrolls over to him and like George was like you know yeah that's great and now I'll draw that but make it good and he did and like the rest is history the funny thing is and this was like a total serendipity because George had never seen this movie I don't think he'd even heard of this movie but I've talked constantly in interviews and in promotions and stuff that I've said one of the big influences is like the films of Bill Forsyth who's like one of like Scotland's greatest creative voices he made films like Local Hero and Gregory's Girl and in his first film That Sinking Feeling the main character has a haircut that's exactly like Thumper's and like that's just a total like there's no way that he could have known that I never made that note but true I'm exactly like that it's like the universe kind of like making all things align and go now Adam what have you done to put your personal spin on stuff yeah because you know I, obviously I came into this most of the characters were kind of designed out you know they were done I did sort of try to soften the edges a little bit of Ennis's face because there are moments where he needs to sort of emote and there are moments where he needs to sort of have a little bit more personality and you know a metal solid face there's no facial expressions so I did try to play around with the shadows and the highlights around the eyes to make them more innocent or make them more villainous in times so there's one character I like very much her name is Crudgel she's leading the moral panic and I read John's initial writer description of all the characters and all the designs and kind of what he wanted and he said that character was based on Mary Whitehouse who was the actual person in the UK who led the moral panic he also mentioned Tilda Swinton in Snowpiercer who was according to John doing an impression of Mary Whitehouse in that role and so I looked up videos of Mary Whitehouse and she's kind of a fine old lady but I really like Tilda Swinton a lot especially in Snowpiercer because she's just such a cartoon of that character and so as that character only shows up briefly in I think the first issue in a couple little panels initially she was designed to look more like Mary Whitehouse I think but I have definitely pushed her all the way toward Tilda Swinton in Snowpiercer because it is just too much fun to draw like why would you not draw that kind of a character and you know she's got these big glasses and these big teeth and she wears the fur coat and she's just terrible and I love every bit of her Adam's coming on board for issue 3 to take over our duties and that's an issue but you know Crudgel really comes to the fore she's like the real monster yeah. of the story essentially and like I think really like Adam did a great job latching onto that character's like you know here's my chance to really kind of like make my imprint and like those scenes <laughs> I was actually just looking through those pages again today and I think like you know you can really feel like you know that's the real point and like you know you're going to like this is what the tone of the story is going to be and like I think like those scenes are a delight and then you know every gesture is like you know fine tuned just make you hate her more but I've been really dying to know what is the synopsis of Death Cabbage <laughs> oh wow yeah like you know like this movie was made by a militant vegan back in the 1980s it was actually made with him it was a film with a message which was like you know cabbages have feelings as well don't like being chopped up and like sliced apart how would you like it if a cabbage chopped you up and sliced you apart or you wouldn't like it much would you so that's like the basic premise it's like you know cabbages gain sentience and they decide they want to topple their human oppressor <laughs> and yeah so like it's the early stages of the new generation of you know like the world under its cabbage overlords the end of the world begins today long live the cabbages <laughs> long live the cabbages there we go there's your sound bite so obviously vault comics is a pretty cool publisher i've been enjoying everything they've been putting out so i guess just both of your experiences working with them for me it's been remarkable this was already a team that was established when i came on they'd already done kind of the first two issues and so i was coming in kind of as an outsider but every single one of them you know, except for John, he's been awful. Every single yeah, one of them has just been better. supportive and enthusiastic and just welcoming at every level. You know, everyone at Vault has just been wonderful. And the kind of the enthusiasm that they're all showing towards this project is really validating, really makes the whole process very fun. Yeah, Vault's been fantastic. Obviously, I was a big fan of Vault's output before we even started working together. Like, you know, I love these Savage Shores, Money Shot, What With Monsters. Like, you know, I, like, I could keep on naming <laughs> books. They make great comics. So when they finally said, like, let's do something together, 
together. And like I started sending them pictures, like, and then they said not only did they want to do something with me, but they wanted to do the nasty, which was like this book that I'd had as a weekend of like, you know, this is my passion project that no one's ever gonna want to make. You know, I knew this book, you know, was gonna get made by Vault. I was like, Vault are doing this is gonna be the biggest comic I've ever done. So that as I had I had some pressure with it, but it was also really exciting. And yeah, the whole the whole process has been great. Adrian, Lasso and their Shing, you know, they're like the editors, they have really great notes, you know, they really make you think about your story. Conversations with them have made the comic better. They're great. Then obviously you have like, you know, Damien hands in the publishing end of things, he's great. Tim Daniel, he's like a legend in terms of like design stuff. The whole marketing team, like Dan Crary, David, yeah. I forget Alex, like they're all amazing. Like feels like whole ecosystem, like at every level you're feeling supported, you're getting upheld. And obviously, like, you know, when the promo window started and this book was kind of getting close to TFOC, we really felt the might of that promotional machine behind us. We saw like the great platforms which are, you know, running features on the nasty where we're getting like interviews like set up with fine establishments such as yourself. You know, we've had like, you know <laughs> with the exception we've had like you know, <laughs> We've had the works more than ever before. I mean, I've worked with good publishers who've like done good marketing, but nothing on this level. It really feels like they really care about their books. It really feels like you're part yeah. of something special. Like you know, the delight, and like, I'm already wanting to work with them again. Like you know, so like yeah, no, it's been great. We've heard very similar things from the other Vault creators that we have interviewed. So that's great to hear. I love like when they came on in 2016. They've just been getting bigger and better, and it's great to hear that behind the curtain just as well. Like, seeing them go from that to where they are now. It's been amazing. Obviously, with the pandemic, everyone got a little scared of what was going to happen, but they've weathered the storm well, and they're doing awesome yeah. now, and we're really excited. Would you guys rather be hunted by Jason, Freddy, or Red Ennis? Uh, Freddy. Freddy's got jokes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's it. <laughs> 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 Freddy was one of the scariest for me when I was a kid so probably not I would say Red Ennis because I'm his master and he will do as I say <laughs> I him. there it is there's the loophole <laughs> alright so this is a Panelized Podcast PowerPoint game show there's no real winner except you guys for getting to see the PowerPoint that I made you know in my free time you dedicate so much time to this podcast you edit it you do all the clips and all this mm-hmm. and then you still do this shit which always goes <laughs> <Yeah. me>. so <laughs> <laughs> Jeremiah, you're going to be my announcer voice. Name that horror villain. <laughs> John. Adam. <Hey. laughs> <laughs> so we're going to show you some images of horror villains see if you can name them uh, some of them will be really easy some of them will be really hard and we're going for names if you want to say the movie they're from bonus points that don't exist but it's really the specific name of the character oh this is going to be tough Freddy <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for giving me one. <laughs> Vecna. Now the real question hey. is, who would win, Freddy versus Vecna? Mm, this is the this whole is one point of these of things where like probably <laughs> Vecna, but I, my heart says Freddy, so I'm gonna go for Freddy. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go with John. So unanimous, Freddy. He's I just gonna win Vecna. from popularity. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got a gross-looking young lady. Yeah, Linda Blair. Reagan. It's Reagan, or we could technically say like Captain Howdy, which is the entity possessing her. <laughs> okay, so yeah. it is Reagan, but what is it, Captain Howdy? Yeah, Did yeah. Well, I think that's that. what she calls me. Has some other demonic name, but oh, so you're like that deep into her? Okay, <laughs> I he do, might I actually he get wasn't messing around. <laughs> he might actually get my character then. <laughs> I've right. came prepared. I've been looking for the one. <laughs> I'm taking this seriously. Sadako. Sadako from the Ring. Yes. Now I got the. Yeah. American version. Just more and more. I'm, I'm, oh. The last VHS I ever rented was The Ring. Mm. And wow. at the yeah. end of it, they actually played the actual Ring video that they watch in the movie. I am not shitting you. Yeah. The moment that ended, my phone rang. Ran out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> it, right oh. when it ended, the phone rang. Oh, we were young. I remember I watched that original ring. It was on VHS. And when I got the video, I was like sick with a fever and I was like bedridden. And I, for some reason, I thought to make myself feel better, I'll watch ring which is the worst type of watch movie like that <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> so, yeah, it was terrifying. so again between reagan and samara or sadaka who would win between these two i think samara slash sadaka wins because reagan's like you know ultimately like she's like you know just like a scared girl that's possessed like you know 
I all it took was a burly priest, like, you know, slapping it about for a bit, and, like, that was her save. Like, you know, Sadako's hardcore. She's, like, you know, telekinetic, you know, immortal, vengeful spirit, driven by pure hate and malice. She's going to win this one. And Eve's got so, good, like, points to back this shit up. So. <laughs> a burly priest smacking her. Sorry, Adam, I thought I was coming over here. What's your opinion? No, man, I warned them before you got on that this game wasn't for me. <laughs> All I right. hope you're still enjoying it, Adam. Okay, so this yeah, is yeah. my favorite horror movie, my favorite horror villain. What we see is just basically a white mask. Now, can you identify this, John? This has actually maybe stumped me. This could be the this could be maybe the mother and the grudge, but I'm not sure. Better image, the mask is now shattered, and Ooh. you can see the creature or the entities face a little bit. Do you have I've any recollection of this movie? This movie it was called Darkness Falls, where the villain oh, is the tooth fairy. Awesome. It is from the early 2000s. It's not a great movie, but I absolutely love it. So it's on your watch list now, John. You have to watch Darkness Falls. If it's a slasher, I want to watch it. I did the top 100 slasher movies thing. Like, can I watch like 200 slashers? Then I wrote down 100. So, like, I'm looking for more slasher films. Adam, you also have to watch it. Fine, but it's going to be during the day. <laughs> yes, yes, and it's smarter to watch it during the day. Alright, so the next image that we're seeing our shoes coming out from behind a couch. Pretty sure this is Mrs. Doubtfire. I feel like I'm making all this is. <laughs> Pretty sure. <laughs> nah, this was the scariest horror villain of all. I think I know who this is. I think I recognize those curtains. I'm trying to remember what her name is. All I can think is, is like, kitty, 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 kitty. Like, you know, from mm. an addition. Like, you know, as I'm thinking, is it a Sammy her name is or something? You are not <laughs> even close. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god I'm... all right i'll give you that they, the... they did have those buttons in addition though they Believe probably you. used the same house for the movie so here's oh, the face oh scary movie like, you know, yeah. ghost face or <laughs> not real ghost face you know what's up fake ghost face so who would win between ghost face and tooth fairy tooth fairy would destroy in my opinion Obviously, Tooth Fairy because he's your favorite, so I'm going to have to choose him. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. I think how many times Ghost Face died. Oh, here we go. Oh, There's yeah. Joe Mallow. <laughs> All right. So, yes, this is your character. And what about this one? Oh, do you want to get this one? Red. Yeah, I'll get this one. Uh, it's Red Ennis. Okay. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Who would win? Well, a funny story. John. If you read issue three of the nasty, you'll get your answer. Oh no! Oh! No. <laughs> 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 I didn't see that coming. All right. Neither did Joe. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, very good. You guys officially win. I say a hundred out of a hundred. Good job. Thank you for playing. And while we have slides open, I thought we could just look at some really cool covers. So first off, here we have our B cover, which is by. Sally Cantorino, who is such a great artist. Like I already mentioned, I walk with monsters, but I definitely were talking to people I wanted to be involved in this book. Like Sally Cantorino's name was high up. Like, you know, I think she's great. I think she, everything she does is great. I love her current series she's got with Colin Bunn. She's a really fantastic, exciting artist. So I think it was really cool to have. I think she's on board for our B cover for the whole series, actually. So she'll be like, this isn't her only cover. She'll be doing it throughout the run. Then we have the C cover that's by Man House, whose work I wasn't actually very familiar with until I saw this cover. But then since seeing this cover, I've just been found as much of his stuff as I could because he's amazing. And yes, just blew me away. Oh, here's two of my oldest pals in comics. Robert Wilson the Fourth did the cover on the left there. He's a great guy, really talented artist as well. And I've known him for years from the American comic scene. And I think the composition of this image is great. Like, I want that image on my wall. I'm going to try and buy the original art off of him if I can. Like, it just looks amazing. The one on the right is by Ian Laurie. And that's a cover that's particularly emotional resonant to me because me and Ian go way back because he's a Scottish comic creator back in the, in the earliest days of my comic career I first met Ian just under a decade ago now we released And Then Emily Was Gone <clears> which is my big breakout horror series one of the first things that really got me attention so we did this bit together and yes yeah, so I thought it was really exciting to be able to do go full circle and now to have Ian on to do a cover for us it felt quite poetic and he did a great job with it so I was pleased to have him on board first we have one from Max Sarin and the funny story I keep on saying about this is I'm a huge fan of Max Sarin and like Giant Days more than any other comic was an influence was what inspired the nasty in terms of like the tone and like you know the vibe we were going for so the Giant Days was huge for me I mean AJ when we were first coming up with like potential candidates for like cover artists he said who would you like name anybody like you know if you could name like Jim Lee like you know if you name anybody like you know like who's your like high in the sky wish list and I was like top of the list would be Max Sad and obviously you know Max Sad I mean not able to get Max 
Sadden. But like someone that captures that kind of vibe would be quite cool. And he got actual Max Sadden. So like that would be <laughs> like, you know. And this final one is Jason Sean Alexander. We asked for like any references of homages. This is homage to the Toolbox Murders, which is one of the band video nasties. So yeah, he, he did a kind of like callback to that cover, which is great. And obviously it's an awesome image. Like, you know, this is like thing where a rarest cover. It's like a real killer image. It makes it feel really special. And obviously Jason Sean Alexander kills it with, you know, everything that he does. So it was really cool to have him on board for this as well. Wait, that's Jason Sean Alexander? Yeah. yeah. Okay, because I'm used to seeing his spawn covers. This is really cool how he did this. Like, it's awesome that it's an homage. I kind of yeah. figured that this one was an homage. That's dope. One on the left there. So <laughs> you want to this yeah, one on the one on the left is me. Oh, that's my cover for issue two. There's a scene that takes place in a movie theater in that book. It was so rich with ideas that I decided to recreate it for the cover for two, but with Red Ennis coming out of the screen. And the, instead of the crowd, some of them are leaving and screaming and vomiting, but most of them are just stoked that this is happening. And I put just little bits of like story into every little character. You know, if you can get up close to it, everyone's doing something. It was just so much fun to draw. Yeah, like, I love this cover. There's so many little jokes for just to discover in this. Like it's like a rich tapestry. I think my personal favorite of all the little stories is the little kind of like rom-com meet cute, which is happening on the kind of like right hand <laughs> corner of the audience. We have like this guy who's like running naked down the aisles yeah. and there's a woman like <laughs> cheering them all and like you can do that you know <laughs> like that, like, it's like a great old woman yeah all of my covers are colored by Kurt Michael Russell who's the colorist coloring my interiors yeah. as well on all the pages and the job he did on this cover is just incredible it feels like a dark theater that's lit by fire it's so perfect yeah. love those rich oranges the cover on the right was the original cover for issue 3 by George Cambadeus before he left the book so like Adam and Bart have already put together a dynamite cover for issue 3 which captures the spirit of this one but adds its own unique twist to it I can't wait to share that with you that's going to be the next cover that gets unveiled the next round of solicits knock your socks off it's amazing I did want to go back <laughs> to cover one though just the detail in it between all the posters and but my original promo art I was going to try and get him stabbing one of you in the head but I just couldn't line it up right <laughs> <laughs> we kept moving yeah I had to get both of you in there yeah you know? I, when I first came out of the project to do all the movie posters and so in agreeing to that Tim said I could do a cover for them like a variant cover and he said why don't you just do something with all the posters because you already have those drawn and so I kept a couple preliminary drawings where it was just like the counter and the register and, and a bunch of movie posters and it just I couldn't make it work but in the original poster for Labor Day the first Labor Day kind of my favorite part of Nightmare on Elm Street is anytime Freddy came out of something like any kind of tangible object in the room that he <laughs> couldn't possibly fit in I loved him coming out I don't, like a I don't tail know phone why. <laughs> yeah yeah that's the best for the it's TV like, it's uh, prime time yeah. bitch and then yeah, shows yeah, exactly uh, and so for the first poster for Labor Day 1 it's a scene where they're at a barbecue and you just see the giant arm of Red Ennis coming out of the grill to stab the guy cooking and it's just a round Weber you know it's not a basin for a human being but his giant arm is coming out and so in drawing that poster above the guy falling asleep at the counter I was like oh why don't I have Ennis coming out of the poster and so it just snowballed into this hot mess and again Kurt Michael Russell Beautiful, huh? colored this just knocked it out of the park yeah that's great I mean it's not just because we're talking to you but it is the best cover if I'm being honest <laughs> and that is my dog as much as, as much as the concept of the book and all that I think there's so many people who might not have otherwise noticed this or known that they would love this that have seen that cover and are like what is this book so I think it's done wonders for us just the posters alone you can spend like a good 10 minutes just examining this so at the beginning of the podcast you guys mentioned the previous work that you have done is there anything that is coming out that you guys want to mention or promote or any of your older stuff that you want to give a shout out to and have people go look up I'll be on this until September and then after that I'm going to get back to my own comic I've already started the second Tufts and then there's one more chapter for the very first comic I ever did one that we've already locked 120 pages of so I'd like to maybe get to the third chapter of that but also I'd like to just take a week off yeah like I'm obviously good an ad and asking about a big release this year that's going to take us right through for the rest of 2023 but yeah I've got more Sync coming out Sync is probably one of my most popular pure books some of the ones I'm best known for I think there's been two volumes released so far in OGN we've got volume 3 launching this year it's starting on Kickstarter so we're doing three Kickstarter campaigns over the year one is just finished we had over 200% funded big success we've got another one that's coming in the summer and another one coming in the fall which you know are going to be collecting special Kickstarter exclusive deluxe editions of the series and then following that we're going to have a direct market release of volume 3 just to close out the year so there'll be lots of sync coming for anyone who's been patiently awaiting that and yeah other than 
that. I've just got new things that I'm developing, new things I'm pitching, new things I'm writing that hopefully will be seeing the light of day before too long as well. All right, very cool. And with that, why don't we give the final plug for The Nasty? The Nasty is in shops on April 5th. FOC is passed, but you can still go to your local comic shop and ask them to get it in for you while stocks last. So if you're feeling FOMO, you think you've missed out, it's not too late. Go to your comic shop and let them know you want a copy. Well, we both really enjoyed the book and yes, everyone needs to go buy it. I'm a little upset that we got to read issue two because by the time issue three comes out now, I have to wait. <laughs> June? Like it's going to be June. Yeah, so I <laughs> might like email you guys and be like, hey, you got any like PDFs for me? Because I want to know what happens. <laughs> but but I think you guys are a great team. I think the story is fantastic. I'm really excited to see where it goes. And yeah. Where can everyone find you and follow you? I have a website, adamcahoon.com, C-A-H-O-O-N. And then I'm at Twitter and Instagram. I'm Adam C. Cahoon on both of those. Yeah, I'm on social media. You can get me at John Lee's 97 on Twitter. You can find me talking about comics and movies and all kinds of other stuff. And you can find me on Instagram where, like, as you've seen from earlier on, you'll find various pictures of me in swimwear. Yeah, I also have a newsletter, deepender.johnleescomics.com. That's deep-ender.johnleescomics.com. Every week, every Friday, without fail, you'll get a big missive in your inbox full of, like, the latest news from me, original essays, all kinds of other stuff. We've got a Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash John Lee's, full of various exclusives, monthly original stories, behind the scenes content, page by page commentaries, script archives, all kinds of cool stuff. And I've got an online shop, John Lee's Comics.bigcartel.com, where you can buy all my back catalogue and probably more stuff coming soon. All right, very good. Well, I can't thank you enough. Again, love the book, love everything you're doing. And I got to do some research and see some of the other guys' stuff because art gallery. You have to send me the link for that. I want to see. I will. I will. <laughs> Panel with Podcast. Panel with Podcast. So I planned an intro that has a reference in it. You may or may not get, but I'm just letting you know that I'm going to say something random. Pretend. That's fine. I'm, I was so just going to roll for that. I wouldn't be like, I wouldn't even stop and cut you off mid-sentence go, what was that reference? Explain it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the warning happen. that something random is going to happen, which is no warning at all. <laughs> <laughs> Doing the nasty. I sound too Scottish and you want me to say something like, again, <laughs> <laughs> clearly. Just let me know. I'll do that. You guys are going to put in the subtitles afterwards? I'm yeah. going to use AI. To, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hi, I I am John Lee's doing the nasty. I love how we're spanning not only the Atlantic, but all of the United States at the same time right now. Yeah, no, yeah, we yeah. did pretty good for lag. Jeremiah, you were lagging too at one point. Doing the nasty. As soon as this thing's online, just tag us, let us know any links we need to share. Yeah, you're going to be sick of me. I do about three posts a day and I'll do it for about a week and a half straight. So leading up until the release of the episode. Yeah, you're already blocked. Week you're already blocked. <laughs> the only thing I love talking about more than horror is myself. So like, I'll have to <laughs> <laughs> doing the nasty first two issues are fantastic guys thank you very much and thanks thank very you. much for being a time of chat I know like Vault spoke incredibly highly of you like they said like you know you've got to talk to these guys the interview they did with, you don't need to um, lie to us <laughs> well they paid us no no I'm not, so I'm not bullshitting like you know I'm through this, this screen caps you know they said these guys are great 